On the morning of August 29, 1965, following an eight-day mission that set a then U.S. spaceflight duration record, the crew of Gemini 5 splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean. Three weeks later, on September 20th, NASA formally announced the crew for Gemini 8. The commander would be Neil Armstrong. The former naval aviator and X-15 pilot had served as backup commander for the Gemini 5 flight. A native of Wapakoneta, Ohio, Armstrong had been selected to join NASA in September of 1962 as part of its second group of astronauts. Gemini 8 would be Armstrong's first space flight. Selected to join Armstrong as pilot for the mission was David Scott, a graduate of West Point and veteran of the United States Air Force. Scott was part of NASA's third group of astronauts selected in October of 1963. He was the first astronaut of that group to be selected as a primary crew member. Gemini 8 was planned to be a three-day mission. The ambitious flight plan called for the crew to perform America's first docking of two vehicles in space. Also, if all went as planned, Scott would become only the second American to perform a spacewalk. As originally conceived, it was the crew of Gemini 6 that was to perform the first docking by American astronauts in October of 1965. As the Gemini 6 crew waited to launch, an unmanned Agena target vehicle that was to serve as the docking platform lifted off for a trip into Earth orbit. Six minutes after leaving Cape Kennedy, the Agena target vehicle exploded. Without a vehicle to dock with, the Gemini 6 flight was scrubbed. Even as concerns over the reliability of the Agena persisted, thus raising doubts as to its successful use in the future, Armstrong and Scott continued their training. Eventually, on December 15, 1965, Gemini 6 successfully launched and rendezvoused with the crew of Gemini 7, which had been in Earth orbit since lifting off on December 4. The successful flights of Gemini 6 and 7 cleared the way for the launch of Gemini 8, scheduled to take place on March 16, 1966. When the morning for launch arrived, Armstrong and Scott began suiting up in preparation for a liftoff set for 11.41 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Meanwhile, ground controllers continued to closely monitor the Agena target vehicle that was scheduled to launch at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and which Armstrong and Scott were to dock with later in the day. Concern remained as to whether the vehicle would properly perform or if another catastrophic failure would befall the Agena. Docking was a skill vital to carrying out a lunar landing. Another failed attempt at docking could be a huge setback to the Apollo program. Soon, Armstrong and Scott entered the transfer van for the trip to Launch Complex 19 and their awaiting Titan launch vehicle. The 109-foot-high, 10-foot-wide vehicle would take about six minutes to propel the Gemini spacecraft and its two occupants into orbit. As technicians worked to secure the two astronauts into their spacecraft, weather reports from around the world indicated excellent conditions for their flight. As Armstrong and Scott lie safely in their spacecraft, they along with the rest of the world waited to see if the Agena would lift off on time. Gina lifted off at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, exactly as planned. The on-time launch was critical to a successful rendezvous and ultimate docking. The vehicle achieved a circular orbit 160 nautical miles above Earth. With the Agena safely in orbit, Flight Director John Hodge gave the go-ahead for the on-time launch of Gemini 8, set for 11.41 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Five. Roll. 
like the Agena before it, Gemini 8 lifted off exactly on schedule. Armstrong later described the launch as one of the greatest thrills that can ever be encountered by a pilot. At 11.47 a.m., the crew of Gemini 8 achieved orbit. The crew's primary focus now was rendezvous with the Agena, which meant employing the use of radar to aid in locating the vehicle. This is Gemini Control Houston. About two minutes ago, Neil Armstrong called in over to Nana Reeve, and he was able to confirm at that time that radar lock had been established. Approximately four hours after their launch, Armstrong and Scott had caught up with their 26-foot-long Agena target vehicle. Okay, we've got a visual on the Agena at 76 miles. Roger, I understand. Visual Agena 76 miles. Soon the crew closed to within feet of the Agena. Sorry, right, Houston, this is Gemini 8. Uh, we're station keeping on the Agena at about 150 feet. Way to go, partner. You done it, boy. You done it. The crew spent the next 30 minutes visually inspecting the Agena to ensure it hadn't been damaged during launch. The vehicle passed inspection and the crew was given the go for docking. Okay, Gemini 8, uh, we have TM solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and dock. Armstrong took control of the Gemini spacecraft, applying thrust from thrusters arrayed around the vehicle to inch toward the Agena's docking collar. As Scott later described it, at first all was quiet, then a firm clunk and capture as the docking latches joined the two spacecraft together. We're flight, we are docked. At 6 hours 33 minutes, mission elapsed time, Armstrong became the first person to pilot a spacecraft into docking with another. The crew had achieved a major milestone in the development of techniques necessary to land on the moon. Once docked, the crew began maneuver tests using the Agena's engines. Even as maneuver testing continued, ground controllers and the Gemini 8 crew focused on the Agena's performance over concerns its attitude control system was malfunctioning. The attitude control system, or ACS, was a series of small rockets situated around the Agena that could be fired to make small changes to the Agena's position. 22 minutes after docking, and moments before Gemini 8 would slip into nighttime and into a radio dead zone, Capcom Jim Lovell communicated a prophetic warning to the crew. If you run into trouble, and the, um, the attitude control system of the Agena goes wild, just send in Command 400 to turn it off and take control of the spacecraft. Did you uh, copy that? Command 400 referred to a computer code that once entered into the Gemini spacecraft's onboard computer which shut down the Agena. Unbeknownst to the crew and mission control, Armstrong and Scott were minutes away from the first potentially fatal emergency involving a crew in space. Armstrong later recalled that it was Scott who first realized there was a problem with their spacecraft. He recounted that Scott noticed from the attitude indicator instrument that they were no longer in level flight. Armstrong employed the use of the Gemini spacecraft's attitude controls to remedy the situation, but to no avail. Scott then entered Command 400 into the onboard computer, thus shutting down the Agena. The problem persisted, however. As the situation intensified, Armstrong made the decision to disengage the Gemini spacecraft from the Agena. Doing so only worsened the problem. The spacecraft was spinning dangerously out of control. According to Armstrong, the spacecraft turned into a tumbling gyroscope. It was clear the problem was not with the Agena, but rather the Gemini spacecraft. 21 minutes after falling into radio silence, communication with Houston was re-established. With the rate of spin increasing, Armstrong quickly grew concerned that he and Scott may lose vision or worse yet, consciousness. Armstrong concluded that the only way he could regain control of a spacecraft was to use the vehicle's re-entry control system or RCS. It worked. The rate of spin began reducing. According to Armstrong, it took about six minutes for the spacecraft to slow to a safe rate. Despite having solved the problem, 
Mission rules required that once the RCS was engaged, it was necessary to land at the earliest opportunity. The crew had next to prepare for emergency re-entry and splashdown. As the crew fired its retro rockets for re-entry over Africa, vessels on Earth were scrambling to Gemini 8's anticipated splashdown zone. Originally planned for a splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean, Gemini 8 would now come down over the Pacific Ocean. In James Hansen's book, The First Man, The Life of Neil Armstrong, Armstrong recalled the re-entry, saying, We appear to be dropping at a prodigious rate. We could almost see the Himalaya Mountains coming up at us. According to Scott, the spacecraft slammed down into the Pacific Ocean with far greater force than either he or Armstrong expected. He remembered that about 30 minutes after touchdown, the two men heard the sound of an airplane raising the specter of a speedy recovery. But as the airplane overflew them, their spirits sank only to be rejuvenated 10 minutes later when the airplane returned. Three power rescuers aboard the aircraft jumped into the Pacific to secure the crew and spacecraft before being ferried to the USS Leonard F. Mason. Within hours of the return of Gemini 8, NASA scientists identified the source of the problem, a short circuit in the wiring of the Gemini spacecraft's number eight yaw thruster caused it to fire erratically. Despite the crew's inability to complete all of their mission objectives, the flight of Gemini 8 was widely seen as a major success due in large part to the docking. As for Armstrong and Scott, in a post-flight press conference, they were hailed as the most accomplished engineering test pilots and space pioneers by the director of the Manned Spacecraft Center, Dr. Robert Gilruth. If you enjoyed this edition of Manned Space, please be sure to subscribe. Also, watch for our upcoming video on the flight of Apollo 11. Thanks again for watching Manned Space.